Welcome back. I'm sorry if I look a little blurred or dark, but I'm sitting in a hotel room in Santiago, Chile, and the light's not that great in this room, but I'm going to shoot it anyway. I mean, what's to lose? So it's been four weeks into October, and it's been a very interesting month, and I'm using the word interesting the way China, the Chinese use it as a curse. It's been a tough four weeks for stocks, not just in the U.S., but around the world. So I thought it'd be a good time to take a look at where we are in the market and give you at least where I feel I am in my investment portfolio. Let's face it, any time you have a market sell-off like you have in the last four weeks, it makes you sit up and think about what you're doing. Maybe you should be reacting. Maybe this is the correction that people have been warning you about for the last six years. Maybe it's a time to get out of stocks. Maybe you need to reassess what you do. And those thoughts cross my mind just like they cross anybody else's mind in a period like this one. And as I've been wrestling with what to do, I find myself going back to a four-step process that I've used over and over again in the last few years, and I've posted about this before. The first step in this process is, in a sense, to hit the pause button. What does that mean? There are two things I, try, I, I realize happen in a crisis, and these are things that are embedded in us as human beings. The first is you panic, and when you panic, you react. When you react, you do stupid things. In fact, what I often think as instinctive is often really stupid. So the first thing I've learned to do when there's a market crisis is to take a deep breath and step back from the action. That's easier for me to do than somebody who works <clears throat> as an investment portfolio manager or as a hedge fund manager. I can take a step back and I find it's very useful not to be caught up in the mood at the moment. The second is I turn off the noise. <clears throat> Let me explain what I mean by this. 30 years ago, if you were an investor, an investor not in the sense of somebody whose job it was to be a professional investor, but a doctor, a lawyer, a factory worker with all of your money invested in stocks, and you went off to work in the morning, odds were that you didn't even know what the market was doing during the course of the day. You were too busy doing your job. And then you got back home and perhaps saw the news in the evening, the 6.30 news, the 7 o'clock news. And you'd see a couple of minutes about stocks, usually talking about the Dow, and then maybe a minute or two of expert, expert analysis. And then you were done. You went back to watching your favorite sitcom and you stopped thinking about the stocks in your portfolio. You're saying, how primitive. You're right. Today, we can constantly you know, track what's in our portfolios. We can trade in the middle of the day during our lunch breaks. We can trade while we're sitting at our desk. We can have a ticker tape running across. And I'm not sure any of this is good because studies have shown that when you get feedback constantly, you tend it, it tends to exaggerate all those irrational impulses we have as investors. So the second thing I try to do is turn off the noise. What does that mean? I don't watch CNBC and I don't please I, I, I love the people on CNBC. I'm not this is not about them. This is about the collective feedback you get by watching the market news all the time. I don't read the market news incessantly. I don't have an app on the on my phone that tracks the stock prices. I try to step away from that constant information flow. Doesn't mean I'm not tracking what's happening at the end of each day, but it's not incessant, it's not continuous. So that's the first step, just take a deep breath. The second step is to, to take a look at the numbers yourself. Because when you have a market crisis like this one, there are so many experts and each one claims a different reason for the sell-off. One says, at least in this sell-off, I've heard reasons ranging from this is, um, uh, th this is due to tech stocks swooning and uh, coming back down to earth. I've heard that this is because uh, of the Fed you know, planning to raise rates. It's because of Saudi Arabia. It's because of Italy. I mean, any now, I've heard at least a half a dozen hypotheses. And while I, you know, I respect many of these people, I can't take the, these facts as given. In fact, I remember the old saying, Ver you know, trust but verify. So I decided to take a look at the numbers myself, and I have the advantage of having, being able to go to the raw data to do it, to see if any of these hypotheses hold up. Let's start with the first one. It's the Fed's fault. Hey, let's face it, for the last 10 years, the Fed's been responsible for pretty much everything that's gone bad with the market, right? And so why not this one? So the argument is the Fed is planning to raise rates, and that's why stock prices are swooning now. Well, that hypothesis is not backed up by the numbers, at least if you look at what Treasury rates have done during the course of this month. While stocks have been collapsing, T-bond rates and T-bond rates have been pretty stagnant. 
If people expected rates to go up in the future, they would go up right now. There is no conceivable way where you'd expect T-bond rates to go up six months from now, but T-bond rates actually go down in October in expectation of higher rates in the future. So looking at what's happening to current Treasury rates, it's difficult to justify that hypothesis that it's a fear of the Fed that's driving stocks. It is true that rates have risen over the last few months, and maybe this is a delayed reaction to the rise of rates between January and October, but that's it's a very delayed reaction. It's almost like the market waited four months. Oops, rates have gone up. We have to adjust prices. So I'm not sure it's a Fed's fault. Is it a tech meltdown? I've heard that story, so I decided to take a look at where the market capitalization collapse you know, was greatest by looking across sectors. These are S&P sectors, and if you look across the sectors, and this is all U.S. stocks, it is true technology stocks are down about 8.7%. You're saying that's terrible for the, for the month. But that's not that much higher than the overall market, which is down about 8%. And the three sectors that have done the worst are actually not technology. They're energy, they're materials and industrials, all of which had seen, have seen double-digit declines over this, uh, over this month. The two best-performing sectors actually were um, uh, uh, our um, utilities, which goes against the grain because... Utilities are usually punished when you expect rates to go up. So it's actually added ammunition against the Fed case and consumer staples. But overall, there is very little evidence looking at the overall sector data that technology stocks are to blame. Now, I've for a long time argued that we're being lazy when we categorize all technology companies as if they're all alike. When in fact the technology sector is aged and dis and become very divergent. In fact, for a few years now, I've been looking at technology stocks broken down by age of technology companies, where the age is defined by looking at the founding date of the company to today. So, if you look at a company like Apple, it's almost 30 plus years old, which is ancient by technology company standards. I've described technology companies as aging and dog years. So what I what I did here was I took the techn all U.S. technology stocks, broke them down by age from youngest to oldest, and looked to see whether October was different for the different groups. And there is a difference. The youngest technology stocks are the ones that have seen the biggest median percentage drop in stock price. But remember, these are also smaller companies, and the drop is big in percentage terms might not, might not be big in dollar terms. But at least there's some, some, some preliminary evidence that it's the youngest tech stocks that have been punished the most. But even the old tech stocks have not been spared. And remember, many of these older tech stocks are trillion dollar companies and an 8% drop in a trillion dollar company is a lot of money. So I decided to focus in on the five biggest names in technology, which are, of course, the FANG stocks and Apple, to look to see what they've done during the course of October. I'll give you the number that's going to shock you first. They've lost collectively $276 billion in market cap. You're saying, oh my God, that is incredible. But as a percentage of their value, they've done no worse than the rest of the market. So they're looking very much like, in fact, they've done slightly less worse than the rest of the market. And for those of you who own these companies, please don't even start on complaining. Because while you might have had a bad October, if you go all the way back to the start of the year, over the course of this year, including what happened in October, your companies have created $521 billion in market cap. And that's including the October drop. So they've actually accounted for almost all of the market rise, or more than the, than the collective market rise for all U.S. stocks this year. So the FANG stocks have had a bad October, but no worse than the rest of the market. And you could argue that at least they had a lot more fat to burn off than most of the companies. So it's not a technology problem. Is it a correction for overvalued stocks? For a long time, old-time value investors have been warning us about this market, how people were indiscriminately valuing companies that did, didn't deserve to have high values. And they pointed to companies with really high price earnings ratios. They said those stocks are clearly overvalued. Is this a correction of those stocks? Well, to see if it was the reason, I broke down all U.S. stocks as of October 1st, 2018, into five PE ratio classes from lowest PE to highest PE. And I looked at companies which have negative earnings separately because there are a lot of companies with negative earnings. 
if this hypothesis of this being a correction of overvalued companies is right, you should expect to see the price drop be greatest for the high PE stocks and the negative earnings stocks and lowest for the low PE stocks. Well, there's a little bit of evidence in your favor. The, the negative earnings stocks, in fact, had the worst October of any of these groups. But the next worst group was actually the lowest PE group, not the highest PE group. So if this is an over correction of overvaluation, it's happening in a very strange way because the lowest PE stocks are actually being punished more than the highest PE stocks. Maybe it's a U.S. problem. After all, we've been hearing about uh, the, the, the midterm elections coming up. Maybe this is a specific to the U.S. Well, we know it's not true because you look around the world, every part of the world has been affected by this, uh, this correction. In fact, I broke the world down into broad regions to see where the pain has been the greatest. And it looks like Asia is feeling most of the pain. The three worst regions of the world, China, Japan, and small Asia, are all losing, uh, you're seeing double digit drops in market capitalization. Now these are dollar returns, so they include in addition to the market, the, the domestic market drop, the change in their local currency, but it's clearly a global problem. In fact, the only market that has done well, during, well in the sense of at least going up during this period has been Latin America. And the reason for that is very simply Brazil, where the political developments over the last three weeks have been a positive for markets and pushed it up. But overall, this is a global meltdown, which leads you to a fifth possibility, which is maybe this is a panic attack. Now, we know what happens when markets panic, right? Stocks collapse, but then you see a whole circle of other reactions. You see government bond prices go up. Government bond rates should go down. The U.S. Treasury bond in particular should see rates drop. You should see uh, the dollar strengthen, flight to quality. You should see um, uh, an increase in value of the safest stocks, stocks with a lot of cash and a lot of earnings. You should also see a jump in the, in the prices of crisis assets. Gold is a classic example. Now, we already know that the safer stocks did not benefit from this crisis. We already know government bond rates did not drop significantly during this. So two of the elements of panic are not there. I decided, look at the U.S. dollar during the month. Was there a big jump in the dollar, which should have been consistent with the panic story? Not really. In fact, um, most of the currencies, the dollar strengthened very mildly. And the one currency where there was a big move, it actually depreciated against the Brazilian rei for the same reasons we talked about why Brazilian stocks have done well. It's political developments in Brazil. So that doesn't seem to be consistent with a panic attack. I looked at, at gold and gold has had a good month. It's up about 4.44%, but it's not a panic month, a month where it jumps 20% or 25%. And in fact, I also took a look at Bitcoin. You're saying, what's Bitcoin got to do with this? Bitcoin, I, I describe as the millennial gold. In fact, if you look at the language of Bitcoin, of miners and mining, clearly it was designed to be the millennial gold. And if it's a millennial gold, it's either not doing its job or millennials are, have, are just completely sitting out this correction. They're not even seeing it happen because Bitcoin is actually down for the month. So it'll be interesting to, to track this over time because it'll give us another indication of, as to where Bitcoin might end up in the future. So what now? Step three, I decided to take a look at fundamentals. Now, everything affects stock prices. So to me, to give some structure to this, I look at the four pathways through which any new story can affect stocks. It can be through base year earnings and cash flows. It can be through the expected growth in these cash flows. It can be in a risk-free rate, and it can be in the price of equity risk or an equity risk premium. And here's how you can have a market crisis. You can have a shock to base year earnings or cash flows, something that causes your base year earnings to drop by 25 or 30%. Take a look at Turkey. This happened this year because when the lira depreciated because of the mismatch that companies in Turkey have, you're going to have a base year collapse of earnings and cash flows. It could be a drop in future growth. Why? Because of, again, something that causes you to reassess future growth, a stronger dollar, higher interest rates, maybe that's it. It could be a jump in your base risk-free rate, the T-bond rate going up, or it could be a jump in the price of equity risk. Let's take each one and see whether that could be the culprit. Is it earnings? Well, 
over the course of the of the last three weeks, we've seen earnings reports come out, and they've been surprisingly good. In fact, one of the themes for this year's earnings reports has been that they're better than expected. So the earnings numbers are clearly coming in. And if you look at the S&P 500 reports on buybacks, buybacks are actually running ahead of expected. So it looks like base year earnings and cash flows are not going to be a problem. We're going to be able to deliver what we expect would be earnings and cash flows in 2018. You're saying, could it be growth? Well, growth is tricky because growth is as much of an issue of expectations and and data as it is of perceptions. It is conceivable that in October, people woke up to a delayed reaction, as I said, to the fact that a stronger dollar and higher rates might slow down growth in the future. And maybe that can be a factor, but nothing jumps out at me as this being the big culprit. There's been nothing that would lead me to think that future growth has dramatically dropped off in the last four weeks. Which brings me to the price of equity risk, because if it's not the other three factors, T-bond rates have not changed, the cash flows, the base year cash flows have not have come in slightly above expectations, growth has not dropped off the cliff, which leaves you the price of equity risk. So here's what I did. I use a tool that you've seen me use before, where I take the level of the index and I back out of it, and the T-bond rate today, and I back out of it the price of equity risk, an implied equity risk premium. Now, I've been doing this for a long time, and I usually do it at the start of every month. And at the start of October of 2018, my estimate for the equity risk premium for the S&P 500 was about 5.38%. I updated that premium every day from October 2nd through October 26th. Now, in doing this, I did keep cash flows and growth fixed because you don't get daily updates of those numbers. And I'll come back and talk about the potential problem with that. But if I hold the earnings, the cash flows and the growth fixed, the implied equity risk premium in the last four weeks for the S&P 500 has increased from 5.38% to 5.89%. Now, see, what does that tell me? Well, the question you got to ask yourself as an investor is, are you okay with a 5.89%? Is that enough? Because if your answer is that's too low a premium, then you're telling me stocks have more, there's more downside to come. If you tell me that's too high a premium, you're saying, hey, stocks are a good buy, I'm going to go out. So it's the 5.89% premium is historic, is higher than historic norms. And you could argue that the, the jump in premium, maybe some of it is due to global crises, though it's tough to sustain because both the Italian and the Saudi crisis happened after the equity risk premium started to climb already at the start of the month. It could be that perhaps there is a reassessment of growth going on. And in fact, if you replace the 7.29% expected growth that I have in my base year spreadsheet with a 4.71%, which is historical growth over the last 10 years, the implied equity risk premium drops to about 5.28%. But 5.28% is still perfectly okay. I can live with that. It's much higher than historic norms. So the price of equity risk has is the issue. I, I don't see it as something that causes red flags to go up. So now I'm ready to think about what to do next. Now, one of, the, one of the problems when you're in a crisis and you react to what's going on is it's very easy to get thrown off your game and forget what your core investment philosophy is. You forget the, the who brought you to the dance and you do something you shouldn't be doing. So I find myself constantly revisiting my, my investment philosophy. Now, remember, I'm not saying there's one in, that my philosophy should be yours. I, I'm not a great believer that there's one investment philosophy that's right for everyone. But I do believe that there is one philosophy that's right for you as an investor, and it's dangerous for you to abandon it. So here's where I stand. I am a value investor, though I am with a twist. And here's what I mean by a twist. I'm not a Ben Graham old-time value investing investor for two reasons. One is I believe that in coming up with a fair value for a company, not a conservative estimate of value. I've never believed in coming up with low-ball estimates and trying to beat that. I want, an, I want a fair value. And I believe that that fair value should include a value for expected future growth. You're saying, but that requires uh, speculation. I've had that pushback. So what? 
other than cash in hand, everything is in the future. You think just because you're a mature company and things are guaranteed in this world of disruption, that's not true. So it's true I have to make estimates and I have no qualms about making them. So the first is I can find high growth companies to be undervalued, which is part of the reason you've seen Twitter and Facebook in my portfolio. And you might see Tesla and Netflix at some point in time in the future. And second, I believe intrinsic value is dynamic. And what I mean by that is I've been told that va intrinsic value should not change. I don't know what universe that's on. In my world, intrinsic value changes all the time, partly because information comes out about the company, but mostly because the risk-free rate changes and the price of equity risk changes. In other words, if I valued a company on October 1st of 2018, and I revalue the same company today, even if no new information has come out about the company, I should come up with a different value for the company today. Because the equity risk premium today is 51 basis points higher than it was at the start of the month. So I believe in revaluing companies in the world I'm in, not the world I wished I was in. So here's what I plan to do. First, I'm not going to do anything rash with my asset allocation. I'm not going to shift into stocks because they look cheap or shift out of stocks because they look expensive. Nothing in the overall scheme of things suggests to me that this is a time to make major asset allocation shifts. What would have caused me to come up with a different conclusion? If the implied equity risk premium were 2%, that's too low. I'd be getting out of stocks. If it were 8%, that's way too high. I'd be getting into stocks. At 5.89%, I'm within my zone of what I think is a fair intrinsic, you know, fair equity risk premium. Second, I plan to revisit all of my existing holdings and revalue them. I do this uh, at least once a year, but after a crisis like this, I often have to redo it because with the new risk premium, who knows what, what I might find, whether I should be increasing my holdings of some companies or getting rid of others, I plan to do that. Third, I, was, I got lucky. I did sell short on Apple and Amazon just at the start of the month. And my Amazon sh short has done very well for me. I'd love to claim I was present, but I just got lucky. So I plan to ride that luck. I have a limit buy on Amazon to close out my position if the stock hits, you know, drops another five, six or seven percent. So I'm ready to close out my position, but there might be a few more short sales I had in the next few weeks and I'll write about them as I do it. And finally, I plan to take a look at some of the stocks that I've had that have been meted out the biggest punishment during the course of the month. I'll take two big names, 3M and Caterpillar which came out with earnings reports and got pummeled. I think 3M was down 13%. I, I'm not suggesting I'm going to be a contrarian and just buy these stocks. I need to, re, to value these stocks to see if their current prices, they are companies I should be investing in. So that's my four, four course action program. And I'm not sure it's going to work for me, but I'm waiting to see what tomorrow brings. So. That's pretty much all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a much more restful rest of the month and that November is a lot less interesting than October. Take care. Thank you for listening.